So he figures a better stab the dinosaur in the head with his trusty knife. But his friend has come up behind him. There's his eye and his mouth. He's about to get bit in the back of the neck, and that'll ruin your whole day and your whole life. So this may be his epitaph. How did our dear brother buy the farm? Well, here's the story in this tomb of how he bought the farm. Now, they also might have warning signs back then. You know, when I drive down the freeway, there's signs, look out for deer, look out for elk. When I was up in Alaska, it was look out for moose and grizzly. Well, they may have had ones like this. Look over your shoulder. There might be an allosaurus behind you. Don't want to get caught from behind. Even more significant are the finding of many baked clay figurines three-dimensionally depicting dinosaurs. These are extremely significant because baked clay can be dated by an entirely ind independent dating method from carbon-14. Carbon-14 is well known to give spurious dates even on artifacts of known antiquity, known date. However, thermoluminescent luminescent dating is based on the luminosity index or energy trapped in the crystals in the clay. It's pumped in, so to speak, when they fire heat the clay. So you can tell how long it has been by how much energy has leaked out of the crystal over time from the time it was fire heated. Now that seems to correlate pretty accurately on known dates of pottery in antiquity. So when this was found, the evolutionists said, ah, great, we'll prove it's a modern forgery. We'll use our marvelous, modern, accurate thermoluminescent dating. And when they did, it turned out to be many centuries old. All of a sudden, they didn't want to talk about it anymore. Isn't it interesting? Well, it, we have many of these examples of baked clay figurines in Dr. Cabrera's museum. Many of them show men and dinosaurs interacting. Here, the Inca stabbing the dinosaur, but the dinosaur is getting his licks in as well. I guess we'll call that a draw. Here they're going after the babies. It's easier to get them when they're babies than when they get big and step on you, I guess. But, you know, these people did not know it was politically incorrect to live with dinosaurs. They just portrayed life as they knew it, and these creatures were normal to them and are part of their normal culture as they depicted it. Now, here we have the local Inca veterinarian trying to uh, nurse a sick dinosaur. He's got a bag here, perhaps of herbs or medicine of some kind. Now, he's not sick because his legs were broken. That happened in an earthquake. But uh, we see this very domestic relationship that they had. Here again, we have them riding the Triceratopian dinosaur. We see the dermal frills that we did not know about till the end of the 20th century. I think these people knew because they were eyewitnesses, not just in Peru, but also in Mexico. In Mexico, they have found tens of thousands of baked clay figurines in El Toro Mountain outside of Acambro, Mexico. If you draw a straight line between Guadalajara and Mexico City, about the middle of that line and a little bit north of it is a little town called Acambro. In 1945, a German immigrant, Mr. Yulesrup, riding along the side of that mountain, saw a little landslide had revealed baked clay figurines sticking out of the soil. He began to excavate. Decades of excavation have now been done. Tens of thousands of these have been recovered, and many of them show known types of dinosaurs. Not only that, thermoluminescent dating dated these to be a few thousand years old, more than twice as old as the ones in Peru. Now, what's really interesting is that the Acambro Indians depicted sauropods doing maneuvers that we didn't agree was possible until the end of the 20th century, when final analysis, computerized analysis of anatomy confirmed the greatest bone mass and muscle strength located in the loins allowed these maneuvers. Well, apparently they knew it, not by computer, but by eyewitness knowledge. Also, their depiction of the Iguanodon dinosaur was better than we had until the latter part of the 20th century. So Richard Owen first tried to reconstruct Iguanodon. He had a tail drooping and a little horn on the end of his nose. Then they realized they didn't have a horn on the end of their nose. They had thumb spikes, the kind of defensive weapons. But they had him on two legs with his tail dragging. Finally, by the late 20th century, we figured out it had his tail straight out and it walked like this. Now, does this look like this? Yeah, the Acambro Indians had better knowledge than we did to the end of the 20th century. Now, <clears throat> this is very well documented on these two videos and DVDs creation evidence from South America, and mystery of a Combro. This one particularly is extremely well documented, well, best, as good as it gets as far as archaeological finds. Plenty of living eyewitnesses still. Their attempts to disprove it totally backfired horribly in their face. It's as thoroughly established as we can, I think, do anything in archaeology. Um, Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation has some of these photographs. I'm currently sold out of that, but it's on the order form. Notice the well-known old science book, The Astoria Animalium, claims that dragons were still not extinct in the 1500s, but the animals were said to be extremely rare and relatively small by then. Well, after the flood, lifespans decreased, size decreased, tremendous change in the climate and ecology of the earth, I think, precipitated that. And I think dinosaurs eventually went stink extinct in Europe, like the Astoria Animalium said, because of overhunting. They're having trouble adapting to the harsh world after the flood, and man pushed them over the edge of extinction in Europe by overhunting. Man has caused a lot of animals to go extinct by overhunting. With teamwork, with poison-tipped weapons, man can kill the biggest of animals. 
Now, that was Carl Sagan. He wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden. In there, he said the pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. It is a worldwide phenomenon. And this bugged the dickens out of him. He said, why, these dragon legends, they sound like dinosaurs. They sound almost explicitly in some cases, like known types of dinosaurs. He said, and yet it can't be that the Bible is true, and dinosaurs were created with man and survived the flood and all that. That can't be true. So he said, how do we explain this from an evolutionary point of view? So in this book, one of his main theses was, well, these ancient people didn't realize that dinosaur and reptile brains evolved all the way up to human brains. And so they had a latent vestigial memory in their brain of when they used to be dinosaurs. And this reptilian section of their brain prompted them to have nightmares that they were fighting and battling with dinosaurs. And that's where all the dragon slayer myths came from. Believe it or not, notice what he said. In the dreams of humans, the dragons can be heard hissing and rasping, and the dinosaurs thunder still. Well, I think the Bible has a far better explanation than that. But you know what? Carl Sagan got the Pulitzer Prize for this incredible book, which goes to show that if you sing the song the world wants to hear, no matter how ridiculous it may be, you will get rewarded for it. Uh, Bunyip's and dinosaurs. Bunyip is the name given by the Australian Aborigines for a big reptilian swamp monster that was in their swamps in the middle of the uh, 1800s. When white settlers moved near that area, one of them found a huge, fresh, unfossilized bone. He asked the Aborigines, what on earth kind of monstrous animals run around your swamp here that have bones this big? They said it must be the bone of the Bunyip, our swamp dragon. So the Geelong Advertiser newspaper got fascinated. They said, well, we want to know what this Bunyip monster looks like. So they interviewed Australian Aborigine eyewitnesses, got all the eyewitness details. Then they made a composite sketch of what a Bunyip looks like. This is a copy of the actual sketch published in the year 1845. It is a museum quality accurate in the minutest detail depiction of a known type of dinosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur called a hadrosaur. Now, this is an amazing thing. It's not a dead fossil. The Aborigines knew it as a living, walking, breathing creature. And yet, this particular type of dinosaur had not been discovered until 13 years after this was published. Finally, someone found it in the fossil record and reported on it. It was unknown to science. But the uh, Aborigines knew it not by just a fossil. They knew what a living one looked like, and I think it's because the Bible is true. These creatures survived the flood, they lived with man for a time, they were going increasingly extinct, but apparently they were still there in Australia in the middle of the 1800s. Now, a medical pathologist examined dinosaur bone under a microscope and found dinosaur red blood cells still intact inside the bone. In other words, forensic evidence that these dinosaurs did not go extinct millions of years ago. But within the life and memory of man, no more than thousands of years ago. Here we have an actual photo micrograph.